Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'amalina Bayahdihillahu falamudhillalahu wa mayudhlil falahadiyala Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu arsalahu bilhaqqi bashira wa nadhira Wa da'iyan ilallahi bi'idhnihi wa sirajan munira أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأنه خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى من نطفة إذا تمنى صدق الله العلي العظيم. We begin by saying Alhamdulillah all praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for giving us life. And giving us the opportunity of coming to the masjid to perform our Jumu'ah Salah. We face in this life many trials of different kinds. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith he says, "Lam yabqa min dunya min lam yabqa min dunya illa balaun wa fitna." He said, nothing is left in the world, in the life of this world, except tests and trials. So as we go through life, we are going to face all kinds of trials. Some of these are going to be nationwide, worldwide, like this pandemic, for example, is a test that much of the world has been undergoing. Some of the tests are going to be personal, they may relate to health issues that we may have. They may relate to relationship issues that we may have. They may relate to financial issues that we may have. Some of them are natural disasters. We are always hearing and more and more we are hearing now about fires that are burning down houses, record-breaking high temperatures around the world, drought and famine, earthquakes, hurricanes and tornadoes all over the world, disasters. Personally as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tests and trials. Not just with ourselves, but with the things that are connected to us. Allah says in the Holy Quran, "Wa'alamu anna ma amwalukum wa auladukum fitna." Allah says, "No, wa'alamu, understand, be aware that your possessions and your children they are a test." They are going to be a test, and specifically with regard to our children, we know that they are a test for us because those of us who have children and those of us who see others with children realize and recognize that there are so many different kinds of tests that we face with regard to children. And as parents and as adults, we have two main responsibilities towards them. One is to provide and the other is to protect to provide them with shelter, to provide them with a safe environment, to provide them with food and drink that is necessary for their upbringing and good health, to provide them with an environment in which they can excel or at least survive, and to protect them. One is to provide, the other is to protect, to protect them from evil, from harm, to protect them from predators, whether they are predators of the human kind or predators of the animal kind. Protect them from shaitan as much as we can. Protect them from things within Islam, batil firqas, for example, things like the Mu'tazila movement or the Shia movement or things that are deviated out of Islam, the Baha'i movement and so on, and protect them from things out of Islam. 
like ideologies that will surface, that will exist, that will become commonplace, and that they are being told to buy into. And this thought came to my mind when I saw the movement called Pride TNT, saying that after two years of hibernation, they are resurrecting the Gay Pride Parade in Trinidad and Tobago on August the 21st, this month. And especially when I saw that their theme was rejuvenation. Rejuve in common letters and nation in capital letters. Rejuvenation. And rejuvenation, to rejuvenate something means to revive it to bring it back to life, to give energy to it. And I thought that this group of people, Pride TNT, have an agenda. Whether the agenda that they have, they are aware of it, or whether they are just simply following the agendas of others bigger than them, and maybe even sincerely doing so. Because when you really look at it, this whole movement, not just locally but internationally as well, is an attack on the principles that we as believers and as Muslims hold sacred and hold dear. And therefore, as believers and as Muslims, as adults and as parents, we have got to understand what is this movement and how do we protect ourselves because this is our, protect our children because this is our role as parents to protect them from these deviated ideologies that do not conform to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger have given to us. And make no mistake, the movement of which Pride TNT is part, is no longer about pushing homosexuality and lesbianism. It is about pushing an agenda that allows you to accept what is called, and I will use terms that you may have never heard or you may have never understood, pushing the agenda of non-binary pushing the agenda of gender fluid, pushing the agenda of gender nonconformity or gender queer, and fighting against and challenging a norm that we, most of us as adults, and all of us as Muslims have accepted as coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a concept known as heteronormativity. It's a big word, heteronormativity. And what is heteronormativity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran explains it in chapter 7, verse 189. Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَجَعْلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا Allah says it is he who has created for you, created you from a single soul and has created from him his wife. It is he, Allah, who has created him from a single soul and has created from him his wife in order that he may enjoy the pleasure of living Ilaiha with her. This is what is heteronormativity. It is the concept that society is built with men and women, men who will, as they become older, become attracted to women, and women who, as they become older, from being child, children and babies and young girls and so on, become attracted to men. And this is the concept that 
they want to challenge through activities like this gay pride parade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the verse that I recited in the beginning, وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ زَوْجَيْنِ ذَكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى It is he who has created the pairs. Right? He has created the pairs, زَوْجَيْن, the male and the female from the sperm drop when it is emitted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, from the time of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, because this verse, chapter 7, verse 189, speaks about them. Huwa ladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the first man, Adam alayhi salam, and the first woman, Hawa alayhi salam, and how he has brought them together to live together in happiness. However, there is a challenge in society, the world society today, against this heteronormativity. And the challenge is to replace it with what is called bisexual. Meaning that a person will have a natural attraction to either gender. Or pansexual. A person has no disregard for gender, he loves everything. Or transsexual. A person decides to change his gender from that which he was born. Or asexual, a person does not identify as having any gender at all. Or at least move us from being heteronormative to heteroflexible, where we are willing to accept as normal. So it is going beyond saying that a person is homosexual or a person is a lesbian. It is going to the realm of not even identifying a person to a gender. And the movement in some of the developed countries in Europe and in North America is that when a child is born now, do not assign a gender to that child. Even though you are seeing physical features that lead you to indicate, to, to tell that that child belongs to a certain gender, there, there are laws now being written or trying to be written to say that that child has the final decision. So even though these physical features are there that will tell you that child belongs to one gender or the other, leave that alone and let the child decide. And if the child decides that the gender he or she or they or it wants to follow, does not conform to the physical features they have, then just like with the computer, cut and paste. Cut and paste to make them conform physically. That is going on in the society that we are living in. And how is it happening? How are they achieving this? They are achieving this especially through the school system, through the education system. They are achieving this through books, storybooks, through cartoons. Even some of the cartoons that we grew up looking at are now changing in their heteroflexible characteristics. They are no longer heteronormative. They don't portray a regular relationship. They try to portray a heteroflexible relationship a non-binary relationship where you don't worry about who is male and who is female. You don't think about that as a normal and the normal course of things. Which is quite unlike what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us and told us in the Holy Quran. They are doing it through the internet games that our children are playing during the days and nights. They are doing it through the television shows that they are watching and the movies and even the advertisements. And I just want to give an example about how they are doing this in schools. In 2007, in Britain, the government introduced a policy called No Outsiders in British Schools, developed by a guy called Andrew Moffat. And the stated objective of this was to develop effective means of challenging heteronormativity in primary schools. The, the objective of it 
challenging heteronormativity in primary schools. In other words, the objective of introducing no outsiders in British schools, and it has now become something that is more national in nature in Britain and also in the United States and other developed countries. It is about getting your child to dispel the concept that a normal relationship is between a husband and a wife. Rather, a normal relationship is between two people, whether both are men, whether both are women, whether both are, have changed their genders, whether both are in the process of changing, whether they will change in the future, whether they don't identify as a gender for a particular gender, whether they are identified different from what they physically look like. It is about putting in your children's minds the concept that this is what is normal, not what we have been taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger as being normal, which is heteronormativity. And how do they do it? They're doing it in primary school. So for example, this is an example, they introduce books into the curriculum. One book is called Prince Henry. And in this book, Prince Henry, the king, the father of Prince Henry, is bringing all of these girls for Henry to get married to. But Henry doesn't want any of these girls. So he marries instead one of his male servants. All right? And that is made to be acceptable. That is being taught to seven-year-olds in these primary schools. From seven-year-olds. In another book called And Tango Makes Three, it's about penguins. It's not about humans, it's about penguins. But these penguins, they're both male. And they're bringing up a baby penguin together. Now what is that telling your seven-year-old child? It's okay. We don't need a father and a mother because here these two penguins are male. It's, it's fine, they're bringing up the chick together. This is how they start the process of indoctrinating our children to challenging the concept that a normal relationship between a man and a woman is no longer normal. Rather, what is normal is for a boy to like whatever he wants to like. Whether he likes another boy or a girl to like whatever she wants to like, whether she likes another girl, and this will extend eventually maybe to non-human as well. It may extend, you never know other than human, right? Because the acceptability can go so far. What do we do about it? Because this is not affecting now children who are 17 years old and 18 years old and those children who are, you know, trying to find out themselves, what is my sexuality like? How do I feel? Do I feel like a boy? Do I feel like a girl? Who, do, who am I attracted to? Am I, as a boy, as a Muslim boy, attracted to another boy? How do I deal with that? It's not about these teenagers anymore. This is seven-year-old children that they're attacking. It goes on into high school as well, but it starts at this very, very low level, very, very primary level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, advi gave advice in the Quran that came in the form of advice to Luk of Luqman to his son. When he says in the chapter 31, verse 16, Ya bunayya, akim is salata wa amur bil ma'roof wanha anil munkar wasbir ala ma asabak inna dhalika min azmil umur. O my son, establish salah, enjoying the good and forbid the evil and bear with patience whatever befalls you. Verily, these are some of the matters of determination. There are things that we can do based on this verse of the Quran and other verses of the Quran as well to protect our young children. Because as I said, this is no longer about your elder children, your teenagers, who sometimes don't even want to listen to you. These are about your five-year-olds and your six-year-olds and your seven-year-olds and what they are being subtly in, indoctrinated into, believing and accepting that anything is acceptable 
and that what we consider to be normal is really not normal at all. First is that we have got to recommit them to Dean. Too many of us still look at the most important education we can give our children as the academic education. And we still relegate our, our Islamic education to when there is some spare time. And that's one of the reasons, and one of the failings of our national Muslim community is that we have not developed properly enough Muslim schools. We should have, and in some other societies, like in the United States as well, we see Muslim schools that take you from grade 1 all the way to grade 13. We don't have schools like that, where we take them from kindergarten to primary school, to secondary school, and even to tertiary education. But this is where we should have been heading all these years. Alhamdulillah, there are places like Darul Ulum, Trinidad and Tobago, and other institutions as well, that have been making an effort. But the effort is much less than what is required, especially when we have so many children coming into the public system and where we have very little control of what they're going to be taught. So it is very important, that being said, that we ensure that our children get the Islamic education that's now available even online. Get that Islamic education so that they understand what is correct and what is wrong. And the second thing that we have to do is we have to create an environment in our homes that allows us to be able to communicate to our children and our children to communicate with us. Because if they are unable to tell us what they are being taught in school, how it is confusing them, what the teacher is saying about who is a dad and who is a mom and the acceptability of two moms raising a child or two dads raising a child. If they are unable to communicate those things to us and we are unable to explain to them what Islam says, then they may be lost. And we may, may, we may ask ourselves when they become teenagers, when they become young adults, why have they deviated into one of these Bartil Firikas? And it is because no guidance except that misguidance was given to them. So we have to work towards creating for them a happy home that allows them to communicate and build the relationship that we as fathers and mothers have with our daughters and our sons. And that's not just fathers and mothers. It extends as well to grandparents and uncles and aunts and anybody who has somebody young underneath them because they are going to be confused by this subtle indoctrination that's coming their way, challenging heteronormativity. Also, talk to them about marriage. Many times we want to not talk about marriage, not get our children married, because we know if we, if we are marrying them, we are marrying them in the proper way, following the sunnah. But many, many times, you know, we focus so much on education and career and job and so on, marriage takes a back seat. And then you realize that, you know, they don't want to become married anymore because they're not interested in marrying somebody of the opposite sex. They're interested in marrying somebody of their own gender, which is totally haram in Islam. Talk to them about that. Talk to them about marriage and get them married uh, when the time has come, inshallah. Also, as this verse of the Quran says, teach them to have patience. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test all of us in different ways. And they may be tested as well by an inclination. They may be tested by an inclination. But if we have given them enough Islamic knowledge and we continue to be there for them to support them, inshallah, shaitan will not allow that inclination to get the better of them. And they go in that direction. All right? So, you know, also be there for them and teach them patience. And also be careful about social media. Because social media is one of the big tools that is being used to propagate this kind of thing. The videos that you see on TikTok and on Instagram and all of these social medias that our children are watching, they are subtly also indoctrinating them into accepting. That's the whole point, you know. Nobody's trying to make them gay, you know. It's just about making them accept that an alternate lifestyle a non-binary lifestyle, which means that I don't accept myself to be a man or a woman. I accept myself to be whatever I feel, whatever I wish. And I'm gender fluid and willing to change. I will be a man today and I'm willing to be a woman tomorrow. And I want you to accept me for that. 
And if I want you, to, if I want to use the pronoun he today, and I want to use the pronoun they tomorrow or she tomorrow, I want you to accept that. And it's all about getting our young children to accept that so that they can build a society, the society that Shaitan wants to build for, uh, for, for, their, for their eventual failure. And of course, finally, make dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our society and our children from these kinds of evils because certainly we know about so many of the hadith. And if you think about the hadith about the punishment of somebody who is homosexual, that punishment is not something that is easily done. It's not easily done. Where, where have you ever heard in these Muslim countries anybody going on top of a mountain and throwing anybody off? No, it's not easily done. There are so many conditions before you could do that. But it's meant as a deterrent. It's meant to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hatred that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put such a demoralizing, degrading punishment for something like this that you should be able to say, this is something we will never, we will never do. When we are faced with a society that is telling us this is the new normal and heteronormativity is not normal, then our children are going to become confused and they may be under the influence of shaitan and go into that area. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and protect them from all of these things, all of these fitness that will come their way and indeed our way. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all enter us into Jannah al Firdaus on the day of judgment. Rahim. <laughs>